Good evening, Jeff. Thanks for joining us from, from Dallas. It's wonderful to join you, Simon. Thank you. So we, we're doing these podcasts for recruitment transactions and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a buying and selling platform for people in our industry, in the recruitment and staffing industry. And you have a lot of experience of building businesses and uh, investing in businesses. Um, and we've known each other a while. And so I'm, I'm just so delighted to, to have you on. And I think, you know, if we could maybe start, Jeff, if, if that's good with you, that the whole K Bassman story, my simple understanding is it's the largest single site search business in, in the United States. So that's impressive in itself. But can you just walk us through quickly a little bit about Kate Bassman and its growth and, and your involvement with that? Sure, I will. But I'd be remiss if I didn't start off by saying um, we obviously go back a long time. I have such incredible fond memories of all of the time we've spent together. I'm extremely appreciative. And so anyone should know I used you with incredible um, delivery of phenomenal service in helping us formulate a lot of our plans as it related to scale and growth and whatnot. So it's, it's oh, a privilege you, to be here. It's a privilege to be here. So I started very fast, 1989, straight out of college. I started an office that was called Management Recruiters of Plano. So we were an MRI office. That's important because I understood what it was like to be a franchisee, a recruiter working in a franchisee's office. Um, I was a young kid right out of college. I decided there was no way that I was going to be able to compete with all these senior individuals, the people look like me now. And so my way of differentiating myself was an approach that we call to this day market mastery, really being a specialist and an expert within a niche. And that's exactly what I did. I took on a tiny little micro niche. I was very fortunate to be one of the top producers in the, the whole network at a very early age, began scaling and growing a team. That team's still here with us to this day, 35 years later. Um, and I learned a lot of lessons in building that team. But the most important lesson that I learned is that the recruiter is not an employee of a search firm owner. They're an internal client. And if people don't figure that out and get that part, those people that you call your employees will one day be your competitors. You'll be training them. So I learned that being the individual that was the recruiter who had to vie and fight for my opportunities to lead and my opportunities to own. That firm ultimately scaled and grew we were very fortunate uh, throughout the 90s by shifting an entire business model quite candidly. Market mastery was an approach. We entered a world that was retained search and contingent recruiting. Retained at this level, contingent at that level. And we challenged the system and said, why is it retained? Is it a level and contingents at a level? There's no retained and contingent law firms. There's just retained and contingent lawsuits. You customize your relationship around the unique individual needs of the client. Why wasn't there urgency and critical nature? So from the jump street, we sort of transformed that and said, we're not going to choose that label. We're going to call ourselves a client focus search firm. We actually trademarked that at one point. And so market mastery plus client focus search plus the idea of building teams under a professional services model where the individual producer was an entrepreneur building his or her mini business within our walls and our leadership responsibility was to create a value proposition so those producers wanted to be in those walls. We had to create a phenomenal culture. I get to go to work every day. I don't have to. We had to provide all the infrastructure. Whatever they wanted to build, we better have it. If they want to hire, got to have a hiring team. If they want to learn, got to have training. A good website, Marcom. Technology support, tech support. Whatever that was, we needed to have. Then the third part was we needed to have the economics. I'm going to make money on myself. The more I build, the more I want to make. If I develop other people, I want to benefit of them. And of course, the elusive, if the firm be does better because of my contribution and is worth more and generates more profit, I'd like to figure out a way to get a piece of that. All of those challenges we ultimately solved um, and grew the organization to uh, about $12 million circa 2004. Uh, the owner, Bob Bassman, I had become a minority owner. I bought him and immediately created out a equity plan. And that equity plan created several other partners in it. We also exited the MRI network. When we did, we were the number one office out of however many there were. We were double the size of number two. And I learned a lot from that experience. Um, but the most important thing that I think that I learned again was this idea that the recruiters were internal clients and our responsibility was to serve them, to allow them to build their business within our walls the same way that I viewed kind of what a franchise order franchisee responsibility is to help them build their individual businesses. Uh, that continued. We got to 2008. We were a $17 million, $18 million search firm, single site, best company to work for in the state of Texas four years in a row. Phenomenal everything. Let's go out and do this new gig called Next Level Exchange. We're going to do recruiting training, consulting to the recruiting industry because our industry is so awesome. Oh, wait a minute. 
what great time to launch that business better than the fall of 2008. So <laughs> Kay Bassman um, um, was, is, is exists to this day, but that's sort of the, the genesis of KBIC that still exists to this day and is still incredibly successful. There's 40 people that have been there uh, at our firm over a decade, but 2008 was kind of the official year that Next Level Exchange became a thing. Got it, got it. And, and I know Next Level Exchange personally, you know, when I was, I sold my recruitment firm to Recruit Holdings and we, we, won, we ran these amazing academies across Asia Pacific. Uh, and Rob Mosley um, joined us in, uh, in Mumbai, in Shanghai, in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in Tokyo, like all over the place and delivered some amazing stuff. And you jumped in on some of those you know, particularly around market mastery and, and leadership, emerging leader programs. And just talking about next level exchange now, we're like, what, what does that business look like right now? And what are the most significant, would you say, engagements or assignments that um, the team there have been working on in, in recent years? So what started off with this idea that recruiting training when I grew up was a person. Like you'd say, Where, where'd you get your training? And they tell you the name of a human being. Well. My mindset was I didn't go to college to Professor Jones. I went to a university and then I may or like my professors. So I thought recruiting training should be like a methodology and recruiting trainers should be engaging professors. And that's why Next Level was created, not under a person, but under an organization with an approach of sort of the Netflix of recruiting training. Take what you want, learn from a lot of different people. There's a lot of different approaches out there. Um, and that was sort of the orientation. What started out as recruiting training then migrated to, hey, can you help as owners, not just can you help me make more placements, can you help me hire? Can you help me build my website? Can you help me with comp plans, organizational design, career path, structures, systems, equity plans, everything else under the sun? And so that kind of evolved to a place where we have, you know, an academy with online work. We have NLE TV that's like a Netflix. We have a foundation program. We have Next Level Marcon that does marketing communication, Next Level Hire all of these different services. Uh, so I'd say to people sometimes jokingly, we're like the McKinsey to the search industry. If McKinsey was owned by Procter & Gamble and all McKinsey did was consult in consumer products, that would be like Kay Bassman and Next Level Exchange. Now, to be clear, Kay Bassman is no P&G and McKinsey, or Next Level Exchange is no McKinsey. But relative to our search industry, I would say it actually is very similar to that considering the typical size of most search firms that are out there. So Next Level continues to this day, uh, but it actually really has become an organization that we get access to the industry. We learn the players, we get to know them, we work with the firms, and as a result of that experience, that allows us to better understand what firms we could talk to about the possibility of joining our other network, Sanford Rose Associates, or potentially uh, becoming an acquisition organization and our Starfish partners. So it still exists, it's still a vibrant organization, but I'd be remiss if I didn't say uh, it's become less focused on the training and consulting on a one-off a la carte basis and more focused on a vehicle to get to know firms better, to do more in-depth, involved, engaged programs with them through some capacity, predominantly SRA or Starfish. Yeah, no, I, I, look, I, I absolutely get how it's enabled you to, to learn the players in the industry. And it works in reverse too, right? Because that's, that's how we got to know your business. And, and that's why I got on a plane and flew over to Dallas and uh, got to see you guys when I was with uh, Recruit Holdings. And um, so no, like, I absolutely get that. And I'm really interested in the Sanford Rose franchise because that business I know has, has and it's search firms all across the U.S., has grown exponentially. And one of the businesses that I have been involved with, uh, an RPO business in uh, in the Philippines, did, did some delivery work for some of your people. So talk me through that, Jeff. The how, how did that acquisition take place? How did you manage that? Because that's really the focal point, in a way, of, of, of this uh, podcast. And, you know, what challenges were involved in that? And, and, and you know, how, how has that journey been with you from from the point where you, you acquired the franchise to where it is now in terms of size and scale and, if you like, profitability. Yeah, so uh, we acquired the firm in 2012. Interestingly enough, we were hired in 2011 by the current owner, the then owner, Rich Carter, um, and we put on a two-day workshop, charged him you know, money and got paid to deliver content. 
At the end, Rich Carter said, you ever thought about owning a franchise? I kind of chuckled and laughed and shared with him my experience of what I didn't like at being at the franchisee. And he said, well, you know, if it was your business, you guys could run however you want to. Very simple, but one of those light bulb moments. And sure enough came the opportunity that we could create a more high touch uh, value with organizations we developed a great relationship with, but we didn't want to do it under the classic franchise at that time. We wanted to do it under a model really more of like a country club of existing search firm owners sharing resources. Instead of sharing a golf course, a swimming pool, a tennis court, and a gym, most people aren't rich enough to afford their own golf course, but they want to play golf. So what do they do? They effectively share the golf course with 400 other families and pay dues so they can all experience the golf course. They don't need it all day long every day. They just want to go on the course when they want to play a few days a week. So substitute golf course and tennis courts and swimming pool and gym for hiring team, marcom team, training team, business coaches, consultants, on and on and on, et cetera. And so our vision was we're going to be able to grow this by bringing existing search firms into a franchise, a thought process that's kind of insane if you think about it in recruiting. But to me, my mindset was if your franchise is so wonderful, why wouldn't you want existing firms to be part of it? Why wouldn't existing firms want to be part of it if your model was so great, everyone should want to be in it? A lot of people, people that you and I both know said, you can't do that. You're crazy. Okay. Well, we probably were. Our first year, the top line revenues, and I'm telling you top line, not our part, top line, $12 million. K Bassman was bigger than the entire 60 office SRA network. Okay. Uh, over, the, uh, over time, we eventually developed people that trusted us, joined the network, scaled, developed success, helped them build, scale, and grow their businesses, had a 95 plus percent retention that we still enjoy to this day of every firm that's joined. And the number of firms joining each year continued to scale. I think a, a, a transitional peak moment for us was in COVID, interestingly enough. In the year of 2012, the top line revenues of that network had gotten to, uh, from 20, excuse me, 2019 hit 72 million from 12 million. So uh, a 600 plus percent increase from 12, 2012 through uh, 2019. In 2020, when COVID hit, a lot of organizations realized I've, been kind of floating. All captains navigate equally in calm waters, but in some rough seas and challenging times, attaching themselves to the metaphorical aircraft carrier that had been there and done this before was a good idea. Within the first 90 days of COVID, we had 24 firms join us and 40 firms joined us in 2020. Interestingly enough, the revenue, because it was such a down year, went from 72 million to 78 million. Might seem like, well, I don't like, how'd you do that in COVID? Because we brought in 40 firms. But the next year, the wind was at our back because the market turned in 2021 and we went from 78 million to 150 million in one year. And then on to 200 million, excess of 200 million last year and on pace to do more than that this year by adding great firms into the network that are already successful and helping to prove that we can turn a $500,000 firm into a $5 million firm, a $5 million firm into a $10 million firm, a $2 million firm into a $6 million, whatever it is that a firm wants, we are helping them by providing all of the support resources that are necessary to help them design a plan, a blueprint, if you will, for the firm they want to build, and then basically act as the general contractor to help them execute and build it. But it's their plan. It's their business. They're not implementing our model. They're implementing whatever it is they choose to based on the education that we help them with. And that has been incredibly successful. So you got Sanford Rose Associates is an existing search firm network of organizations that are effectively joining this country club, maintaining their own independent identity and brand that we encourage them to do. And interestingly enough, as in like literally any day when it will be officially uh, announced, um, we are starting a new organization. There will probably be a dozen firms to join initially called Dimensional Search that actually is going to be a franchise for new search firms that will start up and want to learn the search business under a traditional franchise environment. And once they're successful, provide them with the opportunity to transition over to the existing search firm, Sanford Rose Network. Beautiful. Love the ecosystem. And, and so geographically, you know, where are these firms located? Uh, I guess they're all over America. And, and are they mainly or predominantly permanent recruitment search businesses? Is there any contracting or RPO? Like what's the service mix that you have? Great question. So there's about 170, 175 offices now all over uh, North America. So I'll say with virtually all but a handful in Canada and uh, one in the UK and Germany. Everything else is, is uh, 
in, uh, in the U.S. Um, firms either tend to specialize, as you know, by function, and functions tend to be IT, engineering, finance and accounting, HR, and they tend to be more local for whatever reason most of the time. They kind of operate on that old staffing model, but it's usually the search mindset person that left, started their own search firm, and they were the permanent or the direct hire person who had more of a search mindset. You know, he said the language of staffing is perm and direct hire. The language of search is search. What they call contract, search firms call it interim. They're just words, but they all mean the same thing. And so most of the offices that um, do search in the fun functional areas, like finance and accounting and IT, have a great synergy to do contract or interim. So they do, and so there's a, a large number of offices that do interim, but I would say the overwhelming vast majority that do interim do it as an addition to the permanent search side. And then the other thing is revenue is an interesting thing, right? So a lot of times a firm will say we're a $8 million firm. And when you peel back the curtain, okay, you did $2 million of permanent search and $6 million of contract. Well, the $6 million of contract, if you took you know, the bill rate minus the pay rate minus the burden, is less than the $2 million direct hire. So it's not really an $8 million firm. It's a $2 million firm with $1.5 million of contract. So it's really a $3.5 million firm. I see. Right? If so, to normalize revenue, you have to take contract and migrate it to a permanent comparison and then compare those side by side. It's a very different equation when you have a you know, $200 million staffing firm might look like a $40 million permanent search firm. So if you want to compare EBITDA or things along those lines, you have to do, uh, compare. That uh, said, there are firms, uh, probably 75% of the offices specialize in industry. And when you talk about industry, now you're talking about life sciences, construction, banking, like on and on in any industry. And the industry-based search firms don't do as much interim, although there are certain ones that do. Healthcare is very interim centric. So the, off, the, the organizations that tend to have more interim in the mid to upper level management world is where you would find more of that contracting style businesses. But I would say the offices are all in the mid to upper and senior level executive search markets. They migrate under what I would refer to as the client focus search approach. There are firms that are classic retained. There are firms that are classic contingent, but most operate under the paradigm of I'm going to find the client's need and then build a solution for that need. And if that is a financially committed search, uh, so be it. If on the other hand, while conducting that search for that client, if I come across great talent that I think can make an immediate impact on that company, I'm not going to let my fee agreement stand in the way of ultimately bringing them top talent and then getting a fee on a contingent basis. So it's a predominantly hybrid, uh, predominantly search with some interim with 75% ish being industry based focused search firms and the others being functional with some doing both and literally spread out all over the US just about every state you could shake a stick at. Um, and we've done a really good job of maintaining the culture and the esprit de corps. So while there is our people that would compete, we do our very best not to ever let you know, organizations in the network that would be like the Coke to someone's Pepsi or someone's, even if they're maybe a rival on a local level from recruiting, then there, there's some history, but they're not even the same market. We're very careful about making sure that um, we have a great country club where the families like each other. What would you say would be the, the key differences between your, I mean, the Sanford Rose franchise and other franchises? Because there's so many. I mean, I remember when I was running my own company back in Tokyo back in the day, we had three, four, maybe five approaches from different global Asia-based franchise organizations inviting us to, to join. And they all have their own strengths and weaknesses. But what do you think sets your franchise apart from the rest? Yeah. So there's an old Texas expression that says, if you're throwing dirt, you're losing ground. So I'm not gonna say um, anything negative about anyone. I am just going to say the franchise model of old worked at one point. Okay. It made sense. I'm going to teach you this business, Simon. You're gonna pay me a sum of money and I'm gonna tell you this brand that you can operate under. And I'm gonna give you a brand and we're gonna pump money into this brand. And then I'm gonna teach you how to do the business. I'm gonna teach you everything there is needed to know it. And I'm gonna provide you with all these resources and tools that you can't get. See, cause there's no thing called an internet. There's no recruiting trainers. There's no anywhere to go learn this information. Maybe I'll 
film it in my video studio on a VHS tape, and you'll get these VHS tapes sent to your office, if you know what that is, to watch it. That's how the business started. And it started at local level in a local market for one reason. Well, I had to interview the candidate and prove that they could type 80 words a minute in the computer and they could do COBOL programming. And oh, by the way, long distance phone call. My God, who can afford that? So we can't do long distance. We have to do local. So there was a reason why this existed. There was no ATSs, no computer software. There's no LinkedIn. There's no internet. There's no ability to go build a website for, you know, for virtually nothing. So the barrier to entry to our industries is virtually non-existent. So you have a model that says, Simon, pay me a ton of money and I'm going to give you this brand. By the way, you're going to go use that brand and you're going to go recruit for companies. And someone else is going to be at that franchise pulling candidates out of that company, utilizing that same brand, going, wait a minute, we're all the same. Nope, we're different. Hey, we're the same family, but wait a minute. But now when we're recruiting out of you, I'm not really them. Oh gosh, that's so-and-so of Chicago. No, 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 I'm so-and-so of Chicago Northwest. We're not the same company. Wait a minute, I thought you said you're all part of this thing. It just doesn't fly in the permanent okay. search industry. It has inherent flaws that once upon a time existed. Alan Schoenberg was my mentor as he passed away, founded MRI, he's a great man. I'm incredibly grateful and humble for everything that that man taught me. I was literally communicating with him on his deathbed. Um, and. Uh, he was one of the pioneers of this industry. So I have incredible mm -hmm. reverence for what he did in a time that this business needed that. The business is not today the same as it was. Sanford Rose started the firm in 1959, 5'9". Think about that. I mean, it's amazing, but the world has changed. So the traditional franchise, it just, it doesn't make sense under the guise of building someone else's brand. Got it. Can we now switch gears a little bit and talk about your latest venture, which brings together everything that you've described so far, at least from my perspective, the, the Starfish Partners. Um, so first of all, what, 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 uh, what problem is that business trying to solve? That's a great question. Um, so the search industry, as you well know, is, I won't say the, I'll say one of the most fragmented industries around. If you look at the professional services world and you think of management consulting, you know, CPA businesses, law firms, um, there are a lot of, it's a cottage like industry, just like recruiting. On the other hand, you do have a significant number, and I don't mean just a handful of very large firms and lots of regional players and middle sized ones. Our industry has yet to develop to that point. And so what you have is, you know, there's a hundred giant staffing players, maybe 20, probably even more like 10, but let's say 20 big true retained search firms. And between those goalposts of the Kellys and the Corn Ferry, all the way in that middle, you have the wild, wild west. And so these businesses are predominantly started by what? Someone joins a firm, they go, thank you very much for teaching me. Why am I giving you half or more of everything that I do? I think I'll quit and go on my own. They usually say things like, I want to be an entrepreneur. I've always wanted to have my own business. No, I wanted more percent, so they go on my own. But they're not really an owner. They're a recruiter that quit someone's firm to get more percentage. But they're good at it. So now they get business and they now get more business they can handle. Next thing you know, they got to hire somebody. Oh my goodness, I got to, how does that mean? Now I got to have HR. Now I have to have payroll. Now I have to have accounting. Now I have to have technology. Oh, now I'm building a team. I got to figure out a comp plan. Now, and on and on and on. The next thing you know, recruiters become owners, not owners became recruiters. Not all, not all. I'm saying most. And so, the issue is, I think there's an incredible desire of many, not all, firms who they didn't break away to be the lifestyle recruiter and just say, man, I can go on the beach, I can be anywhere I want to be, make my placements wherever, and I live my life. And when, the, when I want to stop making placements, I'll hang up my shingle, retire, go on my sailboat and live forever. Awesome. That's half the industry and I support that and I celebrate that. And I think it's amazing lifestyle business, but that's not investable, it's not acquirable. The next individual wants to build the rainmaking business, but the rainmaking business is heavily built on that rainmaker. It's like an incredible world-class surgeon. And then the surgeon says, I want to sell my business. And you go, great. How long are you going to stay on to do the surgery for? Because the surgery center with no surgeon is not really worth anything. That's the next group of individuals. And they want something more and they need to be, to learn how to build a firm where they're not the only surgeon in the metaphorical surgery center. The problem that it solves is those businesses that are in the um, 
rainmaking business, and even I would call it the multiple rainmaking businesses that have not literally vaulted out to the you know, 10, 20, 30 million size, and even some of them, A, they don't have, in my opinion, the resources that are necessary and sometimes the capital to truly scale at the rate they want to. Here's what they do. I make placements. I have to take the money from the placements that I make and go invest in building and growing a business. So I have to work on my business. By the way, I can't let my revenue drop because as I invest in building, growing my business, I have to put money in the business, money coming from my production that is now going down because I'm putting more time into growing my business. And there's the conundrum. So the problem is it's lack of capital for medium-sized businesses that want to scale and grow, that truly desire and have the ability to do it. They just don't have A, the capital, and B, sometimes the resources that are necessary and how to efficiently and effectively deploy that capital. So you're, you're investing your money kind of in a private equity sort of way, right? In, in, in these businesses. Is that, is that how it works along with all the strategic and other advice? Sure. So a couple things on that. Um, the first is, so imagine you're a search firm and it doesn't matter whether you're a $25 million search firm or a $2 million search firm. Um, and you start thinking about what are my, where, where do I want to go with this thing? So there are those who are looking to exit to sell and if you think about most transactions, is it I'm going to exit to sell because I can now be part of something bigger and really scale it? Or is it exit to retire? You'll find very few exit to retire businesses unless they've been built so that the owner does, could travel 365 days a year and the business does the same amount. That might yep. be a part. How many of those are there out of 25,000 search rooms? Maybe 100? And there's not many. Pull the owner out for a year and say, go away. Does the business do the same thing? And if it doesn't, well, that's an owner-centric business, right? So most are actually, I've got the business to this level, but how do I take it to the next level? How do I get from 2 million to 8 million? Or how do I get from 5 million to 10 million or 1 million to 7 million, whatever the number is? And you can't spend a percent. So maybe owning X 2% of something that's bigger is better than owning 100% of my firm that may not ultimately be monetizable and scalable. So I think a lot of individuals view uh, our organization is one that can provide the kerosene on the fire, the roadmap on how to scale and build it, and the team to help them implement that. And ownership is collective by everybody. So there's only one class of stock everybody owns. You own, you own one of the companies that we've acquired or you're a corporate person. It's everybody owns the same kind of stock. The second thing that's a little bit different in our model, I'd say not a little bit different, I'd say it's a lot different, is so we can act like a private equity firm to invest in those businesses, bringing those businesses into a uh, uh, organization that owns search firms, all complementary businesses, those businesses could fold into one of our main flagship kind of brands that are in our search uh, portfolio of companies, or we could maintain its own brand because it's developed that kind of independent identity and then centralize all the resources, centralize all of the support and services, and then provide obviously the capital to grow that business. But instead of them owning their business, they're owners in the mothership. And there's a beyond the obvious of why owning something bigger is more valuable than owning something much smaller, a smaller percentage of something much bigger, is this. Most private equity and investment people, uh, everyone always knows the story of the one person. Like you're in this business, right? Everyone has the one, per you're probably the one person yourself, right? Everyone knows the one person who's the, got the great deal and had the big deal and here's the thing. Everyone tells those stories. Kind of like when an athlete signs some big contract. Did you hear so-and-so signed a $60 million deal? Well, what about the other 10,000 athletes? Well, no one talks about them. Hmm. Well, that's the typical deal, not the one. So most businesses, when you think about it, the reason why PE and all these investment firms are not in our industry is this. You guys are cyclical. You're going to be in life sciences and do $8 million, And two years later, you're going to do $4 million, And your EBITDA is going to drop by 75% in a year and a half. Three producers walk out the door. That could be 40% of your revenue. 50% of your revenue. I'm investing in a company where John and Mary get in the car and decide not to come to work today and your EBITDA is cut and set by 75%. No, thank you. That's just buying human beings. I don't need to invest in that. So this is why you see very little activity. They view the market as cyclical, the nature of, of, of the people as flight risk. They're not attached to the businesses. You have a single owner or I invest in this business, the owner goes, the people fly out the door. It's happened time and time again. It's why you don't see it. And even when you do see it, here's what you see. Someone goes to the owner and says, you know, your business, best case scenario, 
is worth uh, a four times if you want to use like a PE multiple kind of stuff. So you made a million bucks. Best case scenario, you get $4 million. Well, I get a million dollars if I just sit in the chair and stay as an owner this year. And a million the next, and the next, and the next. And in four years, I'll still have the $4 million plus I'll still sell my firm. And they keep with that mindset until they get. And usually what ends up happening is the sale occurs when someone comes in with the gun at their head and says, if you don't get out, I'm quitting and starting my own firm. Okay, I'll sell it to you. That happens a lot. It's never told, but that's it. And, or someone gets to a certain point where they get old enough and they're like, okay, I think I'm going to sell it to the people there. They hand them the keys, give me some money over the next several years. And that is 99% of every business that is sold in the search industry uh, for the reasons that I articulated. It's not the, well, I heard about and I know this. Again, sure, the firm that had $20 million of EBITDA in the height of the greatest market ever in the perfect industry got a six. Great. Okay, fantastic. But so the small guys never going to get on the radar. And even if they did, they're not going to get what they want. They're not going to get what they would leave for. So there's just very little transaction and there's little transactional value and risk. So what we have figured out is that the search businesses that are in our organization are because of our vast team of corporate people serving next level, serving Sanford Rose Associates, serving, if you will, our search firm partners at Kay Bassman and DRI and Full Spectrum and Raymond Search Group and Integrity Search Resource and I mean on and on and on. Ninja Jobs, we just acquired them last week. All of these firms, those organizations now as search businesses are paying SRA and or Starfish Partners to provide services. So Starfish Partners provides resources and services, if you will, to who? All of these businesses. That is a royalty recurring revenue structure entity. As an investors, if I came to you, Simon, I said, you have a $4 million search firm, it's making a million dollars of profit. $500,000 of that profit is no longer profit of a search firm. It's recurring revenue profit of a franchise or, or of a management company, a beat business process outsourcer that has signed a multi-decade deal that is going to be paid regardless. Well, that's a recurring revenue. It's not SaaS, it's not software as a service kind of numbers, but it's completely different. Because of our unique structure, we're in a position, if you will, to have somewhat of a financial engineering of traditional search profit and converting it into profit on a more stable, consistent, structured basis of a royalty style model. I know that's a lot. Got it. <laughs> and and for the businesses that you did you acquire and become part of Starfish Partners, so so what's in it for them? It's a, it's a, it's kind of a stock for stock trade, and there is uh, there's dividends. They share in the dividends of the overall business, and there may be an event at some point in the future, and they will have a, a kind of a share in that. Is that kind of the what is the sell essentially to them? It, it could be so. To date, the answer is yes. It could be an individual, and there's been a couple of these we've looked at, and a couple of them are investigating, where we would provide capital for the owner to buy the owner out, yeah. giving the, the future producers the ability to acquire a good chunk of that organization, but instead of acquiring a chunk of the organization, actually giving them an ability to acquire a chunk of Starfish partners, like what the owner would have gotten, um, and effectively what it would look like is a loan, a loan to the producers to buy the owner out, the loan ultimately is paid back, um, and those producers ultimately become the equity owners in that business vis-a-vis -vis they become equity owners. In, in, yeah. And for them, I've, I've, it's the same structure as you, your answer would be for you know the, the typical person. Their mindset is, I'm going to be able to build something much bigger than I otherwise would have been able to if I was on my own. So being part of this mothership will allow me to scale and grow in a way that I otherwise wouldn't based on the resources and capital. And one day um, when a uh, partial or full monetizing event would occur, which I don't believe would ever be a full one because I believe that in a professional services environment, the people producing the revenue always need to have a share of equity and partnership opportunities from the profitability of that business. But I believe you could certainly have outside investment and outside ownership that is not the um, as long as the key stakeholders and producers still owned a, a, a piece of it. And I think it's an ability for those people to see the capacity to have chips taken off the table. And even if it wasn't an event, 
there's still an internal market of all the other individuals that are producers. They're wanting to buy uh, people's equity, wanting to purchase from each other, if you will. Yeah. So, so you you talked uh, a little earlier about you know a typical search owner he's coming to retirement what does he do with the business does he close it or does he just take a small annuity from his guys and they may not be interested in that but i guess what you're helping to create here is is an opportunity which is a win-win for the retiring the aging owner or owners of those search firms where they can take money off the table their key people their key producers don't run off and start their own business they can inherit that business they take a loan via your vehicle to pay off the the owners over a period of time or all up front and they get embedded within the whole starfish and Sanford rose platform so it's kind of like everyone benefits right that's is that my, my absolutely so yeah. it's probably going to be a seasoned person that's been in this industry a long time that's wanting to um sell and transition to the next level of ownership people, producers to, that can take over the, the firm and would rather minimize some of the risk by just handing them the keys and saying, give me a percentage of the revenue for a certain time period. But it's also heavily focused on the entrepreneur that still has a long runway ahead of them that says, I want to build, scale and grow my business. Um, but this $3 million firm is going to be an $8 million practice a lot faster than it's going to be an $8 million firm. And my overall income from the growing of the practice, the production of the business, the distributions of the equity that I have in Starfish, and the ultimate long-term value of the equity is going to be worth more than my business on itself going from $2 million to whatever number that I, that I, I would do because I don't have the capital to grow at the speed that I otherwise could have. I don't have the resources to deploy that I otherwise could have. And the, the uh, collective nature of the EBITDA from all those businesses is obviously substantially higher than, you know, any one uh, of the entities. To give you a very fast example and someone that you know well, so uh, our partner in all this is Direct Recruiters and Dan yeah. Charney is one of our uh, senior uh, individuals on the board, um, great close friend and we've known him for years. So here's the quick story. Literally 10 years ago, last month, um, uh, Shell Meyerhoff decides that he might want to be open to selling his business to three top guys. Those three top guys, Dan Charney, Mike Silverstein, Dave Peterson. I said, what can you do to help me with this, Jeff? I really liked him and I really love the guys. I said, come to Dallas. We'll sit around a table and figure it all out. You'll film some episodes on Next Level Exchange. I sat in the room with them for a day, ultimately worked everything out. We created a plan so that they would ultimately buy him out. He would maintain a teeny bit of equity and some skin in the game, but it all worked great. We worked out what equity portions they would have. They then created a plan that they could implement for other partners. They implemented our exact comp plan, our practice leader plan that we have in K Bassman, and literally implemented everything that we coached them with, with through Next Level um, and our team that's their Next Level SRA team. They were under $4 million as a search firm 10 years ago. 10 years later, we acquire and merge, I should say, we merged with them to ultimately form what was Starfish Partners. Um, and um, that business last year was $24 million in search and another $6 million in contract. So together so, with your core search for these million. K Okay, Bassman, it, it's what, like 60, 50, 60 million dollar business? Yeah, they had, so yeah, I say this in, in, a, in a way of, of kind of joking, but like the student became the teacher. They took our principles and our best practices and grew a business that was larger than K Bassman. And I'm so, so happy and proud that there are partners now that have implemented to prove that, that the system um, works, those best practices, that they're not just concepts, you know, market mastery and client focused search and building a team and businesses in a business and entrepreneurship and ability to hire a team and financially benefit of people on that team and how to separate that and creating markets of territory that you can control and own and equity plans and all those kinds of things. They're evidence of the, of, of what can happen when you deploy that. But the aha moment that I had in a funny way was, had we been around 10 years ago with Starfish Partners, we would have written the check to the, the owner at that time. He would have been happy to accept uh, that number from us, which would have probably been less because it would have been all up front or most of it. 
And ultimately, we would have acquired that firm that was $4 million then, and they'd be $30 million part of the start. <laughs> I say that with love for Dan and my and Norm and all the great, amazing, you know, Sheree, the people that are now, you know, I'm happy to bless so, all my partners. Jeff, you know, and thank you. you. I mean, you made the connection for me, for Dan, and it was a, it was an interesting reach out for me. And, and I recall having discussions with you and with Dan and, you know, one-on-one -on -one with both of you. And John Tucker was involved as well with Nick and others. And I'm really keen to understand the, the post-merger integration journey. We talked a lot about what, what, what does good look like for Dan and for the DRI guys, for you guys. You know, how, how can you retain your, 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 the unique characteristics of your respective businesses? How can you amplify and support and synergize? And, and, and what are the risks? And we, we, and we had a lot of detailed discussions around that. But how is that journey gone what what are the key learnings that you would uh take from that that you would apply perhaps to another merger if you if yeah. you want that scale wow if there you know if there was a textbook for like what does a perfect post-merger integration look like i honestly believe we would be a case study in what perfection would look like it has been better than we have dreamed. Our organizations have been able to maintain our own independent cultural identities doing what we did before, yet at the same time come together when it benefits everyone to share through collaborative you know, networking groups, or cultural activities. Um, Dan has become intimately involved as a senior advisor and coach for SRA offices and Next Level. He's been you know, so well received and helping a lot of those offices scale and grow. The people that were doing Marcom, you know, marketing communications at DRI are now doing it as part of Next Level Exchange. It's just been an inc incredible experience. I always thought, you know, well, hey, you know, Allegis owns Major Lindsay Africa, this retained legal search firm, and they also own Aerotech. Okay, like where's that one? And how do they do that? Well, it is obviously a holding company owns different businesses. So you can on paper see that's like starfish to those different businesses. Except in our case, they're very similar businesses. They're not that stark of a different. So what would it be like? And it, it honestly couldn't be better. It's what actually served as the framework for us to realize, wow, we need to hire um, and develop people and acquire firms that are culturally great fits with our organization. And that has actually become the leader for the M&A, not the back, not the, you know, a lot of firms, it's let's look at the financials and now let's go deal with the culture. Ours has actually now become the opposite. Let's look at the investable businesses by the leaders that are there. Are those people the people you'd want to invest in? If they are not, regardless of, I don't care what the P&L says, not an interest. If the P&L isn't great, but the leaders you believe in, those become investable people. So the organizations that we've acquired since then that have become um, new members of our family um, have all been individuals that have just bolted on as if it was another practice at one of those companies. In some cases, with one guy named Drew Wyatt, he was a nurse management recruiter. It was more logical for him just to become part of Kate Bassman because that's we have great history and experience within the healthcare space. So he joined as a partner in the company. And let's say with Drew Fearson, two Drews, um, Ninja Jobs that was just last week who was in the cybersecurity space, he's developed a solid brand around a space that we're not in. So it makes more sense to continue that brand, utilize our resource to help build, scale, and grow that business um, uh, much more significantly. But with the, in this particular case, the two Drews had in common, as does literally every other person we've acquired, is they were culturally aligned with us and are and fit within the way of being and the kind of people that we are. So the DRI thing, short answer, um, gosh, it, you, you were incredibly insightful with phenomenal wisdom on that side of things. Uh, and if there's anything that we did right, it was our ability to ensure that we communicated openly, authentically, collaboratively, regularly, and we did. And to date, we have literally had, I mean, zero issues. So happy to hear that, Jeff. That's amazing because you and I both know most recruiting M&As, they don't work. You know, you take the brand, you take some of the people, you take the clients, you take the PSLs, you take the database, 
and most of the key producers leave over a period of time. I think uh, it's, it's exceptional to hear the sort of story that, that you're telling. Um, we could talk for hours. Uh, it's always so fascinating talking to you. I always learn from our conversations. But it's late in your evening in Dallas, and I have one final question. And, it, and it's, it's, it's envisioning, like, what, where do you want to take this whole thing, um, Jeff? Everything that you and, and your partners have created with Kay Bassman, with Next Level, with Sanford Rose, and now with Starfish Partners. It's all so symbiotic. It seems to be a journey which is evolving and, and, and scaling and growing, but, but there's going to come an end at some point. Like, what, what do you envisage as the possible or probable outcomes for, for this whole thing? <laughs> it's a great question. So I'll tell you, um, I always believe that, you know, there's, you know, the next level is here's your potential. Here's your current achievement. How do you close the gap between your current achievement and your potential? When you close that gap, a new gap opens up your new potential. And we all have those times where we feel, I know what I know to get us where we need to be, but I know in order to get where we can be, it's going to require something else. And that is always exciting to me because it means there's, we're perpetually learning and growing. And we have to have the confidence to know what we're good at and the wisdom to understand when it's time to outsource. So I always tell people, all you're doing is outsourcing when you look at next level or outsourcing when you look at uh, becoming part of the SRA network. You're, outsour you're running your own ship. You're outsourcing to other people to execute upon those things. The same is true for me with that team, outsourcing. So the answer to your question is, that is a so many different options of what it can be. I know that the hard and fast rule is simple. The people at the organization have to be better off because of whatever event there is. I didn't spend 35 years of my entire professional life to go get a paycheck or go get a cash out and a big number. I'm not wired that way, I'm not interested. I'm not even the majority owner of the business, so I couldn't do it today if I wanted to, which I never would. So for me, it's about what is going to allow that business to grow beyond what I could do. How can it become something that it never would have been had it not been but for that transaction? That's the criteria that it needs to be. Now, yeah. there are so many possibilities, right? Well, does that mean you're going to merge with another company? Does it mean you're going to get a private equity company behind you? Does it mean you're going to be public? Does it mean this? How are you going to structure it? What does that financial engineering look like? What EBITDA do you need to get to that level? There's a million of these questions. So. I've always believed in finding those key people and aligning yourself with the people that can help you do that. We brought in John Bartos when it was time to start Dimensional Search and acquired his business and help us with LeafFlow. We've brought in Greg Dorshin when it was time to get another great world-class training coach on our team. We've always done that. An individual, so this is hot off the press. It's actually going to be announced in the next few days, so you'll be the first to hear, by the name of Adam Zoya, Z-O-I-A. Um, Adam is a super smart, bright, wonderful, good human being. He is um, ha, runs a search firm called Glowcap that he's not even been active in for the last five years. And it's a $15 million search firm specializing in the investment space. That firm will maintain its own separation. Perhaps there'll be something we'll talk about it one day, but for right now, we really just brought in Adam, who's gonna be our chief development officer to help answer that question. Uh, I hope that his, uh, um, Wharton undergrad, his Oxford studies, and his Harvard MBA, or JD, excuse me, his <laughs> law degree from Harvard, and his 40 year, 30 years in the industry experience. He put together, I think, a billion dollar deal in the staffing nursing space. He's a super smart guy in New York. And literally, as of, I think, yesterday, it was officially, he is the individual who is going to be tasked with actually um, continuing our journey by going after even larger organizations, bigger firms of larger ilk, and trying to create uh, that same concept of abundance, that we can build something that's never been done before with people of like-mindedness, all under the principle that each of these businesses can operate and continue to flourish. The centerpiece being a corporate team that I believe is the best team of, of professionals ever assembled to support search firm owners and recruiters in building what they want, regardless of what those subject matter, those subject matter experts needed to be. It's a 50 person team that do not work a desk other than helping recruiters and owners build the businesses that they want. That's what I'm gonna focus on and I'm gonna let Adam help us solve that puzzle of what's next, when is it, and what will it look like? So I've taken my own dog food on that one. <laughs> Time to outsource for someone smarter than me on this one, and that's exactly what we're doing. 
So he's you know, I, I love love to meet him one day. Sounds sounds phenomenal, and and I love the scale of your ambition. It's it's interesting. Just just concluding on my side, you talked about your DRI back in the day, and um, you know, you, you probably could have done the deal ten years ago yourself, and it would have evolved into maybe something similar to what it is today. And I always feel with uh, with Kay Bassman and Sanford Rose from Recruit Holdings' point of view that you guys were the ones that got away. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm just so happy on a personal level, a professional level, to see how you know you guys have developed and grown and scale. And uh, thank you so much, Jeff, for your time. We'll, we'll keep in touch. Um, do send my regards to to Nick and Karen, uh, Rob, um, Greg, everyone else on your team that that I know. It's a phenomenal team that you have there and. Dan as well, um, and we'll uh, we'll keep the contact, and um, hopefully I'll see you again this side of the pond or your side. I look forward to it, Simon. You're a world class individual and a world class person that's a pioneer and a leader in our space, and it's a pleasure to visit with you today. Thanks so much, Jeff. Have a good evening. You too. Cheers.